I said wait for them. Anybody to join? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we'll just wait a moment for some people to get on. Yeah. Morning. Hello. I guess before we get going, we'll obviously thank the stay at home guys for organizing this whole event. It's really cool. Something different, I guess. Hello. We're good. All right. Um, so we're just going to go over ourselves. Um, some of you might know who we are already. Some of you might not. Some of you might know me, but you might not know Magdalena, for example. Oh. <clears throat> um, so we're Matisto Chocolate. We started in Sweden back in 2012. Uh, back then it was just myself running the business. Turn your phone vertically. Okay, we, we're going to do that. Thank you, Big Taylor Chocolate, for letting <laughs> That's well, not, we, this is our first live video, so we don't do this kind of thing no. very often. Thank you, guys. <laughs> That's that? better. So I'm Australian. Uh, Magdalena is Polish, and Magdalena is obviously my wife. Uh, I actually come from Alice Springs in Australia, so in the middle of absolutely nowhere. I moved to Sweden back in 2014, 2004, sorry, uh, where I met Magdalena and ended up yeah. staying there. So Magdalena moved to Sweden when she was about 16, yeah? Yeah, 15 actually. 15, 15 then. Isn't. So uh, that kind of leads to the name of the company, which is Matisto, which is actually a language called Esperanto. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's a language that was invented by a Polish guy. It's quite popular back in the 1960s, it was kind of trendy to learn. And it was supposed to be a language that united the world. It was uh, a language that everyone was going to learn and it was going to be the the big thing didn't really take off, but surprising some people do speak it still. So mm -hmm. kind of interesting, but it means an artisan or someone who makes things with their hands, craftsman. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we started making, I started making chocolate in 2012. Uh, that came from meeting a guy that some of you might know called Alan McClure from Patrick Chocolates. Uh, I met him back in 2009, which seems like a long time ago now. Um, he was a bit younger back then too. Um, love what the guy did. He was actually in Sweden visiting a coffee roaster that we were working with. And I love the idea that he was making chocolate. And at the time, it wasn't that common. So <laughs> the, um, he, he kind of got it going for me. He sparked the curiosity and he's a bit of a nerd. Um, I'm a bit of a nerd. Oh yeah. And, uh, that, that got the ball rolling. So it was, Probably about 2011, I started mucking around with making chocolate, and and by 2012, it was a bit of an obsession, and went from there. Uh, Magdalene is actually a dentist, of all things. <laughs> Hello, Wayne. Wayne Eilert. Hi. If I pronounce it right, hi. Hi, Wayne. Uh, yeah, Magdalene is a dentist. We met in Sweden when she was still studying dentistry, so going into chocolate's not a uh, normal thing. Um, There's a request to be, how do you do that? In the month of cacao or something? I don't know. Sorry, just... Magdalena was working as a dentist in Sweden. Uh, when we decided to pack up and move to Australia, obviously that meant Magdalena not working as a dentist, and Australia has very different laws on that. So Magdalena's on board now, and we work as a team making chocolate. And that's been since... 2018, we relocated from Sweden all the way to Australia to Toowoomba, of all places, which is not Atlas Springs. It's not where I come from. No. And starting completely from scratch again. And for those of you out there that are chocolate makers, starting a chocolate factory and getting on your feet is tough. And I spent the better part of four or five years in Sweden doing that. And it meant selling up all of my machines. I sold Pretty much everything. Uh, I don't think I even brought my chocolate molds with me. And 
starting from scratch again in Australia was very, very hard. And I wasn't going to do it, basically. I'd given up on the whole thing. I didn't want to start from scratch. I'd done too much trying to build it up as it was. And it was by chance, actually, that we found some chocolate-making machines about 100 kilometres away from here, and it kind of turned up at the right time. And that was a, a tempering machine and two small universals that were absolute junk. Um, and that led to our, our mould design, which, if you haven't seen our bar, um, is actually... It's the... Uh, it's a sketch of the inside of a universal. Um, the reason for doing that was basically those machines were the reason that we even started the company again. Had we have not found those machines, you probably wouldn't have started Matisto. Um, I'd be doing something different right now. And I did try to do something different. I, I think I'm unemployable at this point. Don't say that. Why? It's true. <laughs> no one would give me a job. Uh, it's a... Uh, I think chocolate makers are a, a special breed of people. And if you're passionate about what you do in anything, I think it makes you a special breed of person also. And it's an addictive thing. And I think it's very, very hard to go and work for someone else when they have a passion and you don't share it. It doesn't really work for me anymore. Um, anything you want to say? Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, I'll think about it. So if anyone's got any questions as we go yeah, along, just, just ask, ask them. Us. We'll do our best to answer. Um, what else have we got? Um, yeah, so we once we did move to Australia, obviously sourcing cocoa in Australia is a bit of a nuisance. Mm. Uh, in Europe, we're a bit spoiled. That There's a lot of, and even in the USA these days, with, with the companies like Uncommon and uh, John Nancy that are doing sourcing to get those beans so that small producers can buy them and it helps a lot. Uh, in Australia, it's very, very early days with that kind of thing. So we ended up finding a guy called Brian Atkin at uh, Makira Gold who's been doing work in the Solomon Islands to try and get chocolate makers to buy Solomon Islands mm -hmm. cocoa. Uh, we loved it, basically. We found it was unique. It was different. We don't mind a challenge. Um, I'm all for trying to find something that is a little bit different, trying harder to make it something special so that we've got our own signature. And it was, again, Alan McClure, who was one of the earlier adopters of Orkison's uh, Madagascan cocoa. He kind of made it his thing. And I still think today uh, when someone says Orkison's cocoa, Alan's one of those people I think of. So we're trying to find something that we can call our own put a, a signature to something that isn't currently massively popular. And it kind of struck a chord with us and off we went and we started buying that cocoa and here we are today. Uh, it doesn't mean we'll exclusively work with Solomon's cocoa forever, but at the moment it's doing what it needs to do and we have a more positive impact that way. Uh, obviously living in the middle of Sweden, access to cocoa farms and direct connections with cocoa farmers is pretty much impossible. So it helps us to bridge that gap a little bit. And Dick Taylor makes a good Madagascan bar too. Mm -hmm. I like your Madagascan milk. I like it. Good. Uh, Just to interrupt, I will answer the questions after because I can't find a way to answer on my phone, so I'll have to answer here if it's possible. Yeah, with something. Just yeah. jump in and yeah, yeah. go for it. Yeah. Uh, so is it Wayne at one a Wayne, you asked where we can buy the yeah. chocolate. Where are you exactly? So we, we do sell in the United States. Um, we've got places like Chocolopolis, uh, Bar and Coco. They stock our chocolate. Um, if you're in Europe, uh, Coco Runners is always a good place. Here in Australia, uh, kind of uh, a little bit everywhere. Sydney, nowhere, unfortunately. Yeah. We, we're yet to find a, a stockist in Sydney that is willing to stock at what they call expensive chocolate. So There's a subscription service from Sydney. Yeah. By you. Yeah. But that's a that's a subscription service. Yeah. But they do they will have some of our chocolate mm -hmm. within the next week or so again. So check out Bean Bar U. They're in Sydney. They also do chocolate tasting events and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So good to know anyway. And if you're interested in this kind of chocolate in general, um, 
<laughs> no, no comments there, Bangin. I don't Bangin, know. Bangin, we can't comment no, on that. No, no comment. But... Um, we're a chocolate factory, and there's a lot of places around like that that don't really make chocolate. So, thank you. We try our best. <laughs> so we, um, when it comes to flavour and stuff, we're trying to go elegant. We're trying to pull that off. Um, I like to roast properly, what I think is proper. I'm not a fan of under-roasted cocoa, not a fan of over-roasted cocoa. Um, for texture, I love smooth chocolate. Um, and that's obviously a personal preference. Not everyone thinks that way, but being is that it's uh, companies like Valrona and Demori and Michel Puzel and that that got me into chocolate in the first place. That's kind of what my goal was to begin with, is to make what those guys make, but put our own spin on it, make it that little bit more special. So they're kind of my go-to companies, you know, and obviously, again, Patrick's and Dick Taylor and what was uh, Rogue Chocolatier. I think those guys are all making amazing stuff. And when I was looking around in those early days, uh, when there wasn't a whole lot of people to look up to, there was those guys. So it was a different time. I think the early... You know, the 2009 to 2012 kind of era was very, very different than it was today, and we didn't have access to the resources and connections that exist today. So different times. If you can find a stockist in Chile, we'll definitely get some there. Yeah. It's not easy, and the logistics is an ongoing nightmare also. the. Recently, the freight companies have put their prices up mm. again because of the coronavirus, so it's making it even harder. So hopefully that relaxes a bit in the future and we can get stuff out there. No, but we're at home actually right now. We're at home. The, the work, the factory is a little bit of a bunker. It's actually a, a giant cool room that's 150 millimeter thick walls. So telephone reception inside of the place is terrible. So it, it really is a bunker or a great big Faraday cage, depends which way you look at it. <laughs> but we will try and do some kind of um, live thing in the future from the factory and we can work out that problem. Yeah. Manashon is good too. Yeah, that is a good So anyone got any more questions for us? Yeah. Anything you would like to know? Yeah, come and visit anytime. Oh, the universals. Yeah. Uh, the universals, I don't know. No. <laughs> they're they're of the um, the eastern variety, yeah. and and they're absolute junk. Uh, so half my time is spent making chocolate, or maybe twenty percent of my time. The remainder of my time is obviously doing business and fixing machines yes. constantly. Building and fixing. So those machines are a, a, have been a blessing and a curse, I guess. Um, but it kind of brings an, another point, which is that I don't think machines really dictate the chocolate that you make. It's what you do with the machines. We used to use... We went from stone grinders to three roll mills, uh, dry conching, wet conching in Sweden, to universals in Australia. We do some stuff in the stone grinders for special bars. Um, and now we're upgrading to a ball mill. So we got our ball mill running last week. So that will double or triple our production without even thinking about it. I don't think it's going to change anything either. So I'm more about finding machines that I think are going to do the job that I want them to do and having control over that rather than fixating on what the machines are and, and that kind of stuff. There's a good question there. How do we capture the fruity yeah. characters? Uh, fruity characteristics are something that is present in the cocoa itself. We try to find cocoa that has a character of its own. So rather than trying to find what's trendy, I would rather find things like our tenor rhubarb which is something special about it, and that gives you something to work with. So from that, it's how you roast it, how you conch it, do all those things to decide how much of that fruitiness you want to preserve and what you want to get rid of. 
uh, dry conching and wet conching, uh, that's a conversation that could go on all day. Um, dry conching is not that common, especially in craft chocolate. Dick Taylor's probably one of the few that I know of that do that. I'm not sure if Art Pollard is doing it at um, his place. Pretty much you have to have a dry mass, so you have to have a roll mill. So anyone who's got a real roll mill and runs it properly, the way it's supposed to be run, they have the potential to dry conch. Uh, dry conching helps get moisture out easier. You can get more moisture out of the chocolate when it's dry because there's less fat to absorb or bind with the water. So that means you can use less fat in the later stages or less lecithin, et cetera. So I love dry conching. I think it's great, especially for milk chocolates. But it's not always a cost-effective way of doing things. It's a, a labor-intensive process, and we've gone away from that since two years ago. But, again, there's ways of achieving similar results in different ways, and it, it's just about constantly adapting and tweaking. Mm, a new exciting product. Yeah, the caramelized white, I guess. Yeah, I don't know if that's exciting. It is exciting. Does anyone think caramelized white chocolate's exciting? So we're going to do that so, so. for Easter. But apart from that, we're going to start looking around for new origins and stuff like that, trying to find something else with a good character that we're not sure where that will come from just yet. Um, now is a tough time, obviously, as you'd all know, when it comes to sourcing and things like that. So, But we've got the whole of Asia right next to us. So there's some good stuff going on in Indonesia, uh, Malaysia. Is great. India is obviously a good thing at the moment. Taiwan, Thailand, amazing. Uh, Philippines. Uh, so there's so much around us and all of the Pacific Islands. So we've mm -hmm. got to start looking around through all of that stuff and trying to find something else that we think is unique. Yeah, there is cocoa in Australia. So for people that don't know, they actually do grow cocoa up in the north of Australia, in Queensland, where we actually live. Uh, which is not that close, it's about 1,500 kilometres away still. But they have the same kind of problems you find in Hawaii and such, that it's, it makes the cocoa very expensive. Um, and there's still a lot of research going on with that. So we'll see where that ends up in the future. We would love to do an Australian bar with Australian cocoa, but we've got to find... It has to be special, otherwise it's just not going to work. Yeah, Indonesia is interesting. I think Indonesia is very interesting. It's always been interesting, and I, I think it kind of gets left on the side a little bit because it has a, much like Pacific Cocoa has, um, your Papua New Guinea and your Solomons, and it has a stereotype that comes with it for the smoky kind of cocoa, and that's just not true. It's That's how the bulk of stuff is, but that's not what's going on right now. So it makes that whole region very exciting, I think. And um, what else we talk about? Um, Any more questions? Yeah. No? no, no more questions. We won this one last year for anyone who's interested. Oh, yeah, that's true. We won the, yeah. the International Rising Star Award at the Academy of Chocolate Awards. How do you stop your addiction? Oh, no, you shouldn't stop it. For our, for our <laughs> sake, you shouldn't yeah. stop the addiction. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Buyers, right? Yeah, I guess I guess the supply is yeah. I mean, the demand is a bit smaller after the fires. People it affected a bit more cautious. logistics mostly. Yeah. The, um, we had they basically shut off freight to places like Sydney and Melbourne. So chocolate obviously is something you can't just, uh, especially when it's hot in Australia, which it was. It was over you know thirty five degrees, and you need chocolate to get to a major city within a day or two, and it gets held up for a week because of the fires. It's that affected shipping. So it was better to just not send stuff and wait for it yeah. to die down. And obviously it went on for quite some time. Well, the virus, I guess, is hurting all of us. So Yeah, I don't yeah. think. I don't know what's going to happen. The, the virus has affected a lot of stuff, yeah. um, mostly international stuff that just stopped overnight. But not just international. There was a lot of big markets, big events mm. planned. All of them are cancelled. Conferences where our chocolate was supposed to be in goodie bags all gone. Everything gone. Charity events where the chocolate was supposed to be used cancelled. So we rely only on um, our local farmers market that is once a week. 
<laughs> some internet sales and basic yeah basically internet sales some retailers are still around but that's 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 about it how much cocoa butter that's a uh, it's kind of like asking how much salt you put on a piece of beef yeah uh, whatever we need to get the job done so it varies a lot but we do use cocoa butter i'm not a two ingredient enthusiast um it's <laughs> it you know two ingredient can be good um for certain things and certain stuff but you know we sell a lot of our chocolate to chefs and a lot of pastry chefs and stuff too and we need the chocolate to be workable for everyone and again european chocolate is my go-to for what chocolate should be so that's kind of my benchmark mm. so i'm not against cocoa butter at all um i'm not a purist in any any way at all i just want to make good chocolate um, yeah we did um northwest chocolate festival i saw you there last year fresco but you were busy so we, we did come to seattle last year um unfortunately we missed out on the craft chocolate experience this year i really wanted to go to that but it's just it, it costs a lot of money to get from australia to north america mm -hmm. and pretty much any sales that we can do they barely cover the cost of doing it and since we are struggling as it is it, it makes it hard it's an extra layer of cost of the situation we'll see you next time yeah <laughs> so yeah we'll try we will try to do more of that stuff in the future but it depends on so many things and obviously the coronavirus is just another yeah. spanner that's been thrown in the works where we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if those festivals are going to go ahead. We don't even know what's going to happen a week from now. So we'll find out. Yeah, we'll find out. Oh, another one. This one I can show you guys also. This is a trophy one of the Royal Agricultural Society of Victoria, Australian Food Awards. Last year, so we were chosen to be the champion Australian small producer. It was for all food products of the show. So best best food product in Australia, which is pretty good. Um, and it's not just a chocolate show. That's a uh, avocados, bacon, uh, Dairy, cheese, meat. chocolate, meats, sausages, spreads, bacon. everything. So that was pretty good. Um, probably the biggest achievement we've had, I guess. Um, probably doesn't mean a lot internationally, but no. it's a trophy. <laughs> it's better than a piece of paper. Yeah, it's heavy. It's heavy. <laughs> Make up glass, actually. So <laughs> good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what else have we got? Um, I guess future plans um, yeah. is to survive the coronavirus, obviously, business-wise and and such. Um, no, no festivals in Australia or New Zealand. We had talked about trying to get one. There is one in New Zealand. It's not a festival, it's, ah, a no, okay. it's a competition. Right. New Zealand has a chocolate competition, but it's only for New Zealanders. So. Yes, we won over bacon. That's an yeah, achievement. We beat bacon. Yes. So <laughs> that, that's a big achievement. Mm. Um, yeah, we're trying, obviously, at the moment, future plans are to survive. Um, we have scaled up. We scaled up at the worst possible time. Um, some of you might know we actually launched a, kick, a crowdfunding campaign three weeks ago. Um, it's been a massive flop, um, probably partly because of the fact that the world has just been turned upside down. So it is still going for this week. Um, we did want to start doing more pan products and things like that and put some more machines into place, but we're going to have to put that on the back burner for now uh, and focus on what we've got. And taking possession of a massive new machine two weeks ago, right as this came in, was terrible too. Mm -hmm. um, but we're just going to have to deal with that and... Yeah suck it up and get on with it and try and make lots of chocolate anyway it's just about trying to find more things to do with that chocolate so we will be getting more drinking chocolate out there more chef's chocolate etc shred your fire is that a fire what's that i don't know no i don't know dick taylor's trying to tell us something but I'm the friend, you are. Oh. Yeah, pan products are great. It's just that our panning machine is tiny and we, it's home built, so we can't yeah. produce much. We don't even have a Chinese uh, panning machine. We've got a homemade one, which is pretty cool. Ah, um, guitar. Yeah, yeah. Shred your guitar. Yeah, I sold most of my guitars, actually, trying to make chocolate. I've got a few of the 
I play too, but Jack, I play the fastest from guitar, and my guitar is broken, so. And Magdalena will sing for you too. Oh, no. I won't. No, no, no. no. <laughs> the port, is, port and chocolate's oh, great. Yes. I don't get into the whole wine and chocolate thing. It really doesn't do it for me. I love wine and I love chocolate, but I prefer wine with cheese um, rather than that. But sweet wines, dessert wines, port wines, Madeiras, mm -hmm. that's all great with chocolate. Beer, dark beers. Beers, good beers. Mm -hmm. Carols. And spirits, actually. Um, whiskey, rum, that yeah, kind of stuff all goes really great peaky, with chocolate. Peaky whiskey. And, a, whiskey and a good right. bourbon, too. Mm -hmm. Don't mind a good bourbon. Um, we should do stuff like that, too. Um, we've been trying to get it stuff like that on board, um, chocolate and rum pairings and all that kind of stuff. It's just there's never enough time. Oh, tea, and tea and chocolate's chocolate, awesome. Always, yes. And, of course, coffee and chocolate. Um, if you haven't tried our mocha milk bar, that's actually we've got another batch in the machines at the moment, so that will be being released again next week. Uh, that actually won the best chocolate product in Australia last year also. And we haven't had it since because we... We've moved on to a different coffee supplier, so it's going to be slightly different, but still coffee and chocolates, good stuff. The shop, uh, we have talked about it, but I think uh, the last two week, weeks have proved that that would have been a bad thing. Exactly. Um, the last thing we need right now is more costs. Mm -hmm. And we do have a factory shop where we sell uh, in afternoons during the week where people can come into the factory and buy directly from us. But as far as staffing your shop and that, it's just, that's tough. So Wayne, you can order from our web shop. Yeah, we do have a web shop yeah. too. You go to our website and definitely ship stuff all over the world, no problem. That was in Sydney, I think, yeah? You yeah. were in Sydney, right, Wayne? Yes. Yeah. So that's no problem at all. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. The main problem with that is shipping. Um, shipping is shipping from Australia or anywhere in the world is way more expensive than the chocolate is itself. And we've been trying to negotiate things with freight companies, but it just doesn't really ever get anywhere. So we are kind of dependent on distribution and stuff elsewhere. We do need to get more into that also. Chocolate. Favorite chocolate of ours. Do you have a favourite? Uh, some depends on the day. If I'm, you know, I'm, I have a sweet tooth. I love sweets and baking, so I always go for the milk chocolates. But that's me. But otherwise, I don't know. I it don't, all depends. I on don't the have product. a favourite. If I don't like it, we don't make it. And we don't sell no. it. So it, it either works or it doesn't. But I, I do love our raspberry licorice bar. Um, I know that was a roaring success in Seattle last year too, mm -hmm. um, even though apparently Americans don't like licorice. But for me, it depends on the time of the yeah, day even. Exactly. There's, there's some chocolates that are awesome breakfast chocolates. Mm -hmm. um, we should coin that phrase too. Breakfast chocolate, yeah, absolutely. We should do the Matisto breakfast bar. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think the darker chocolates, are, I really love them in the morning. I don't know if it's because your palate's fresh or whatever. You just get more out of it, I think. Mm -hmm. And as the day goes on, the milk chocolates are just, they work. I love our Black Post milk with coffee uh, because it's not really sweet. It's actually much lower in sugar than people think it is. Um, and again, Alan McClure was the inspiration for that. We used to do a Madagascan bar that was in the same vein. And it was basically reducing as much sugar as possible and filling it with the maximum amount of milk. Mm. Uh, it gives you a much more malty character to the chocolate. Uh, it doesn't have that sickly sweetness, uh, but that goes great with coffee. I have one minute left. One minute? Yeah. Oh, you got one minute left. Yes. Um, apart from that, no, no favourites. Um, I just, if we don't love it, we don't sell it. So um, otherwise we'd have, you know, 30 or 40 different chocolate bars and, you know, it's impossible to make that many. Fresco, yes, we do. We do. Chocolate Yeah, chocolate bars. Um, so flavors coming soon. We want to do a cinnamon bun. I've been talking about that for ages. So that'll be a brown butter with cinnamon and cardamom. So anyone who nicks that idea, I know where you are. Um, what else are we talk about doing? We've got a couple that I don't think we're going to talk about yet. Um, our time is nearly up. So we'll, we'll be posting anything that is coming on our Instagram and Facebook. 
So just stay tuned to the yeah to our social media. And if you've got any extra questions, just shoot us a message. Yeah, just anytime. We're here all day. <laughs> yeah. No rest of it. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. No guys. problem. Thank you for your time, everyone. Hope to see you stay all safe. soon. And hopefully we will come through this okay. Great to see you too. Miss you too. See you next year or this year, hopefully. Bye bye. Thank you. See you, everybody. See you, everybody. Bye. And.